This is Dell Channel 21, and this is yet another D5400XS sculpture, but this time with all the box and accessories included. But before that, something which I think is a bit more exciting still, and that is this letter. You see, this letter is from François Pierre-Noël. He worked at Intel in the performance division for a long time, and he was the mind of one of the minds behind, for example, the Intel Extreme Edition, Intel Conroe, and more specifically, Skulltrail. And during the video series I did last year about Skulltrail, I got in touch with him via Twitter, and he recently offered to send me some original Intel Extreme stickers, because I did not have, have one. So I gave him his address, and this letter showed up, and, well, what is inside, as I think is really cool, he sent me some Core 2 Extreme stickers. You see here are the regular Core 2 Extreme stickers and these are the special Core 2 Extreme stickers which are a bit larger, which were made for Skulltrail specifically. So that's really awesome. But he also sent me some business cards. Here you can see Francois Pienuel, Principal Engineer, Senior Performance Architect, Performance Group. And on the back he wrote a little note with Thanks for keeping Skulltrail alive. And this is just super awesome. I can't thank him enough, friends. So if you are watching this video, again, thank you very much because this is just awesome. So, with that rather awesome introduction, let's get into unboxing this original boxed, well, it has, it has been unboxed in the past, but all, everything is still here, into Skulltrail. Firstly, what stands out is just how small this box is compared to the classified SR2 I showed in the previous video. Here they are together, and the SR2 absolutely dwarfs the Skull Trail in every dimension. Regardless, it's very cool to see these two together. Starting on the front, there is this big Intel Extreme Series logo, with the D5400XS name, that it has Core 2 Extreme support, and on top there is some info that this is a Socket 771 motherboard with an extended ATX form factor with both SLI and Crossfire support. On the sides and on the top of the box there is just some of that same information printed again. But when we flip it over we do get a nice visualization of the board with all these specific components labeled and explained. On the right side there is a list of what is included in the box which brings me to opening it up and showing the accessories. Firstly, there was this small box which had a CPU socket protector, which was probably put in there by the previous owner. Next, there is a NVIDIA SLI bridge, still in its plastic bag. Moving on to this neat IDE cable, which was wrapped in a blue translucent plastic. Also included are two SATA cables, which are in the same blue color. Of course, an I.O. shield is included. And now this is quite special, it may not seem so, but it's actually a small plastic bracket for mounting a 40mm fan to the North Bridge heatsink of this motherboard. Now, these are very uncommon, and this is actually the first time I've ever seen one. Next up is the original driver CD. Very cool to see that it's still there. And also this Far Cry 2 postcard. Now, I am not sure this was originally included, but neat regardless. Next there is this very big quick reference guide, with all kinds of visualizations on how to set up the board. Very cool to see. Equally interesting was this large sticker, which was meant to be stuck onto the side panel of your case, so you can quickly reference certain info about the motherboard. Then there is this yellow document, which gives some further explanation on the installation and handling of the board. And finally there is this large piece of paper, which has been cut out in the same size of the motherboard. And you can use this to check if your motherboard fits in the case and if you have the appropriate mounting points. And underneath all that there is the D5400XS Skull Trail motherboard.
and of course I just had to put them side by side. On the left is my old one with the Core 2 Quad Extremes installed and on the right the new one which has Xeon E5472s. Well the moment is here, I've installed everything, the coolers are here, installed a 570 just to test, my SSD and hard drive and all is connected to the RM1000X over there. You can see the other skull trail with the QX9775 CPUs over here on the left and it's all connected to my AUC Agon monitor over there. So I should make this clear, I genuinely have no clue if this works. Um, this is the first time I'm going to boot it up um, as of my ownership as when it arrived a few weeks ago so I'm going to turn on the power supply oh yes I do see a little green LED over there so that is a good sign I do have standby power and let's see what it does So far so good, fans are spinning up. I'm going to turn over to my monitor here. Keyboard is connected, it should be. Come on baby. We have video of something. Oh yes. Let's press F2 on that. No hard disk detected. Do apologize for this janky setup here. Oh yes. Appears. As it is working. Go back to the mains. Both are populated. E572. Apparently it's running at 2.8 gigahertz. That's a bit weird. We'll have a look in the processor overrides. Yes, I was to continue. Okay. We'll have a look at this in a minute. First, I need to see if something actually happens. Well, we are now quite a bit further ahead in time. I would have liked to have gotten Windows 10 to work with my SSD, but it just wouldn't cooperate. So I've grabbed this 1TB Western Digital hard drive, which had Windows 7 Professional installed. And everything is running fine as of now. I'll, let it sh I'll show it to you. So here we are in Windows 7 Professional. We can indeed see that there are two E5472 processors, each running at 3 GHz. I should also pop up the uh, CPU Z, and you can see they are indeed at 3 GHz. I have run some tests, and the CPU Z at the moment is around 637 with around 80 for the single core which isn't bad for 2 or 3 gigahertz um, basically core 2 quads um, so now I will get into explaining the overclocking process on Xeons instead of the core 2 quad extremes I used last as I explained in my previous overclocking video overclocking on this platform can be done in two ways either by raising the multiplier if you have the QX9775 CPUs or by raising the front side bus frequency if you have Xeons. Firstly we need to take a look at the specifications of the CPUs. In this case I am using Xeon E5472s and what is important to note is they have a 1600MHz front side bus. However once we look in the BIOS we can only see that there is one bus frequency we can change and that's at 400MHz. This is because the front side bus utilizes a quad data rate, meaning there are four signals per cycle. You might already be familiar with double data rate, two signals per cycle, as it is what DDR memory in computer RAM stands for. So effectively the 
FSB of our CPUs will be 400 times 4, equaling 1600 megahertz, as we can see in CPU Z. With some simple calculations, we can confirm the clock speed simply by multiplying the bus speed with the multiplier. We get an effective 3000 megahertz clock speed. Now you might think, why even bother with unlocked multipliers if we can do this? Well, unfortunately, we can't infinitely raise the frontside bus. On average, the D5400XS tops are out at around 430 MHz, meaning around 3.2 to 3.3 GHz is all we can get from these CPUs. Now, ideally, you would want to get a Xeon on the 771 with a 1333 MHz frontside bus, like the top end X5470 as this will give you more headroom to actually increase bus speeds before running into the board limitations. And under ideal circumstances, frequencies over 4 GHz can be possible. Well, hopefully that has explained Xeon overclocking a bit, and also where the value lies in having the unlocked Q Core 2 Quad QX9775s. Well, after some testing, I indeed confirmed that the max speed of this board is around 430 MHz resulting in 3.23 GHz, still a quite a decent uh, overclock. So we're now booted back into Windows, 430 frontside bus as you can see here, and the effective rated frontside bus is now at 1720 MHz. So we can launch up Citibench R15 again and see what improvements we get. Okay, so the tests have run and the results are in. For the CPU it is now 679 and for the single thread it is now 89. And if we look back on our previous, it was 637 and 83, which means that is about 9% uplift, which is pretty nice and sort of to be expected given the 200 or so megahertz increase on CPU frequency. So let's move on lastly to some gaming. For gaming I tested Grand Theft Auto 5 before and after overclocking, running normal settings at 1080p resolution with all the three sliders maxed out. Unfortunately I did have to set back the bus speed a bit to 425 MHz to remain stable in gaming, so the CPUs were now at 3.19 GHz. At stock we saw 48 FPS average, which increased to 53 when overclocked, and also a 9% increase. And the same is true for the 1% low from 33 to 35, and the 0.1% low from 28 to 30. In both situations the game was very playable. Well, that was all for this video. I hope you have enjoyed this weird mix and match of content, from a letter to an unboxing to overclocking to benchmarking. If you did enjoy it, a like would be very much appreciated. And if you have a comment, please leave one below, or you can reach me on Twitter, which is at DellChannel21. Finally, if you want to be kept up to date on future projects, why not consider subscribing to this channel? Well, that was all for now, and bye bye.